This is just one area of Springtown Camp, and wherever you go here, there's a sense of waste and decay around you. And what follows now is our attempt at a factual record of life in Springtown Camp. There's been tragedy in this cramped space. Mrs. Brennan's husband tells the story himself. All of the two youngsters died out here. What was wrong with them? One was uh, died with saving their money, and the other died with a German of ours in Belfast. What do you blame for that? Well, blame the conditions I'm living in. Did the doctor pass any comment? Well, he wrote a letter to, for the wife to hand into the housing people. And uh, he says if we didn't get inside 12 months, it would affect everybody's house, the health in the house. I'm here on behalf of James Connolly Cultural Youth Group. Today. My name is Paddy Moore. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Willie Deary. I'm an ex-resident of Springtown Camp. What's your memory of the first person who squatted on Springtown Camp? Well, to start the story of Springtown Camp, you'd have to go on the Lyman Street on the night of uh, 18th of August, 1946. There were residents living in terrible conditions in two up, two down terraced houses there. And there were maybe three or four families in the one house, and they had one outside toilet between them. Now, on that particular night, uh, one of the children that lived in our house had died. So the men were up in arms, disgusted, and with the war just ended, there was no prospects of houses for the immediate future. So just they just couldn't take any more. So on top of uh, Lima Street, there was a place called Blees Lane, which housed a, a vacant British Army camp, which was huts. And the men decided, look, even though there's no on water, there's no electricity, there's no heating, they were still a lot better to live up on there than to live in the squalor that we're living in. So three families squatted just before midnight on that night, way back in 1946, squatted on the hut And the next day, word got going round Derry about people squatting on the, the huts. And you could see young children, they were previously stuck up in one room, playing in lush green grass outside the huts. And it was a great sight to be seen. And uh, Word went round Derry like uh, uh, lightning, and so there were other camps in Derry. So people from living in, from all areas of Derry who were living in the same conditions squatted under the camps that were near to them: Clooney Camp, Belmont Camp, Creva Camp, Bush Street Camp, and the Lane Camp, Springtown Camp. Now the reason they squatted under the Springtown Camp was very simple: that the huts were belonging to the American Navy, who used for the build of their soldiers during the war. And the American camps were far superior to the British camps. And they were lining in the, around the town and missing out inside us, which made them more lovable. But again, there was no heating, no electricity, no running water. But the people squatted on the, on the Springtown camp and there they stayed. And uh, the powers that be in the London Dairy Corporation at that time were up in arms, but there were so many squatted on, there's nothing they could do about it really. So they met with the camp of residents and uh, they decided to turn on the water, which means that the toilet, there was toilet facilities then, and sewage facilities at least. So they had to do that because it would have been an environmental disaster if they hadn't done it. Mm -hmm. So many children and so many people living without toilet facilities. So you can just think about that, but it uh, happened if they hadn't got the facilities. So they turned on the water and they, ended up, they went on to meet various committees in each, each camp. And they decided the, uh, these people are here to stay I mean, for temporary until their houses built. So the, the corporation decided with money from the Stormont government at the time they renovated the huts in Springtown Camp and they renovated the huts and they made them on the three bedroom huts and, and there was an inside toilet in them 
and there's a wee sink a jaw box and the living room there's a wee range we got heating light heating in one room <coughs> so that that was the start of Springtown camp that's a good picture of um, of Springtown like you know that was third world conditions the end they used to stuff on the floors called uh, called, called lino now but it was called our cloth then uh, you know um I remember tearing it up, my granny tearing up, throwing another fire to keep a bit of heat in the, in the hut, you know. Um, it wasn't all glamorous or romantic, you know, it was tough, you know. Some tough people come out of the camp too, like, you know, and some very, very good people, like, you know. And uh, I was born in Springtown Camp. Yeah. I was actually born in the hut, uh, 151A Springtown Camp, which coincidentally was the number of the bus that used to come from. from uh, the depot in uh, Strand Road, yeah. out to the camp. So I was born in Springtown Camp. I grew up in Springtown Camp, uh, but that was in 1953 I was born. And uh, we left Springtown Camp in 1967. So um, my mother and father, of course, they were among the first wave of squatters in Springtown Camp yeah. in 1946. I was born in 1946. I was actually born in uh, Belmont Camp, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother says, the army just come one night and just shifted everybody to Springtown camp and we heard after it was political reason to get everybody outside the, the boundary so that the, the nationalist people wouldn't have a vote when they're outside the, outside the, 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 the boundary. But why has it taken so long to move them to decent homes? Is it simply the acute housing shortage in the Derry area? Or is it, as the Nationalist Party says, that there's religious discrimination? An alderman who came to Springtown to be interviewed was Alderman James Hegarty, a Nationalist member of Derry Corporation. He said it was for the corporation as a whole to settle this, but he refused to be interviewed in political terms, simply because the residents asked him not to. Alderman Hegarty honoured their request, but I felt obliged to ask him about land available in Derry City for housing, because the Nationalists allege that Unionists won't let substantial numbers of Catholics into Protestant wards because it would upset the voting pattern. What is the uh, land situation for building new houses? Well, at the present time, as far uh, as, you, as you probably know, we don't get to know very much what the, of the affairs in the corporation, but as, as far as we have been told, the only land available now at the present time is land at Gobna scale in the waterside area. But, after all, in Derry, five minutes takes you out the open country. This is a case for boundary extension. There's plenty of land around. Why, why not build in the waterside area then? Well, that's another question. In what way? That, that Another question. In what way? That that was entirely a political question. And, 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 is Waterside and, and, a unionist or nationalist? Well, no, well, Waterside is unionist, but I wouldn't like to drag that in politics into this affair at all. But um, we were left the dark way, uh, the politicians there. Uh, Eddie McAteer tried to help us, you know, with that. Uh, it was like a toothless dragon, you know. They had no. Like a 30% can't take on. 70%. You know what I mean? But that, the, way that the, the way that the thing was done in Derry then was 33% of the people ruled 73%. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, you wouldn't, they wouldn't get away with it now, like, you know. But, um, People signed contracts with the Long Derry Corporation to be there for six months and then they would be housed. Huh. And they agreed they were paying five shillings a rent per week. That's 25 pence in today's money mm -hmm. per week. And uh, so they all, all accepted this and uh, with the promise of being housed after six months. Six months came and went. Six years came and went. Fifteen years came and went. 
still the people didn't get housed. And the huts with no repairs getting done, community disrepair, and there were vermin in the huts, and they were in terrible conditions, and they were really fit, unfit for human habitations. Another comment, Mr. George McLaughlin, father of seven. Well, when you come on at night and put them youngsters to bed at seven o'clock at night or eight, they're on their line in the cold and dampness. And when you get up in the morning, so it's bound to be affecting their health. Because I seen me often, the wife often, having to get a towel in the morning and drying their hair with the dampness and the frost and the huts. I think it's inhuman. Mr. McLaughlin's hut has obvious defects, some structural, others that are a danger to life. So if you said you're on a big time, never get a job, like, you know, I tried it myself a couple of times, and I even fooled, uh, at, uh, I was on the one one time, and I told them it was from a northern road, and they uh, said, starting, starting Monday. You know, I would all for a joke, like, uh -huh. but what you mentioned, you were a big town, you know, we were second class citizens, like, you know. The riches in the city are just like gypsies. That's the people in London area yes. city itself? Mm -hmm. I don't know why they have a bar against us, but even if your children are applying for a job, it seems, and I don't ask them now what school they went to, but it's as soon as they give spring turn as an address, well, that's them finished. They can't take a responsible position in the city. You would think they're a lot of crooks or something, which they aren't. So, again, the people in the hut decided, even though the, the, the eight nationalist politicians were being constantly outvoted by the 12 unionist councillors at Springtown Campos, there was no foreseeable future for anybody living in camp, rehousing or anything at all. So Springtown Camp people decided to take matters under their own hand. So they fought for their rights and on uh, Tuesday the 28th of March, sorry, Tuesday the 28th of January 1964, they held a march from Springtown and the, the Guilt Hall. And it was arguably the first civil rights march of the 60s. I only learned after the end, you know, remember the marches from uh, Springtown and the Guilt Hall. People just looking for, for a decent house, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And uh, they didn't know then how, what, they were, what they were involved in, you know. Mm -hmm. There was a thing called Jerry Mandan, they were kept outside of this area. They were actually under the Mavadi Borough, and, and it was part of Jerry, like, you know. Mm -hmm. That was just a way of... of uh, 33% of the people ruled 77% 70, 70 of the people, mm. you know, and um, these are like, well, these things really come to light after, you know what I mean? So um, the, the, the forefathers of, uh, of Derry, or, you know, uh, didn't do a very good job, you know, and I think them marches and, and stuff like that, and the, I think of the woke zone and, and people in similar positions, you know, yeah, but the real heroes of uh, Springtown Camp were the people who organised the, the marches, namely Wally, Wally Edgar, Wally Campbell, and uh, Rory Quigley. The, the, well, there were other people there as well, but there was the three people who were very prominent and the, the forefront. And the forefront of it, like you know, and they kept persisting. They kept, you know what I mean. So that that was origin. I believe it was the origin of civil rights and there, you know, it was because they kept marching and they kept going, they kept pestering, you know. And yeah. But I, I, you know, it was it was a case of you know it, we were we, we were a community, yet we were set apart insofar as the Springton camp was, was was surrounded by wire. There was a gate, one gate, the top, one gate, at the bottom. That's where you came in. That's where you, you went out. And everywhere you went in the camp. Uh, we walked so far, you couldn't walk on the rails because the wire was there. I saw good times in the camp, you know, but uh, also some, some very, very cold winters. And uh, there was good neighbours and all. People used to say they left the doors open all because nobody had nothing. <laughs> there was nothing there to steal, you know. But everybody sort of helped each other out, you know. But there were a lot of um, cold nights and 
with hungry days. Like a lot of other communities, I suppose. Um, we 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 were we were uh, joined together uh, by you know looking back, we were joined together by poverty, I suppose, in, in many ways. But as growing up as kids, it, it, that never that never crossed our minds. And I remember a lot of the time coming into the camp and thinking to myself, you know, when you go if you go if you're going home and you go and you go to your front door and you walk and you feel you know I'm at home now. Well, the camp was when you walked in the gate in the camp. You felt at home, you know. Everybody looked out for everybody else. Uh, your mother and father, you had a kind of mother and father in every hut in the camp because the, everybody kept an eye out for everybody. We moved to, uh, like I was about seven or eight, then we moved to, to Craigan and uh, moved on the uh, house of Craigan Heights, a spot new house, and um, couldn't believe rolling up and down the stairs. I'd never seen stairs. <laughs> You know, I never, you know, accepting uh, doctors or something like that. Yeah. I never seen, didn't know what it was like. Well, eventually, I got, it was spring time, I cleared out. You know, my granny was fairly good, nearly one of the last ones. To, not the last, but the last what? Uh, I said she was, she was an old woman then, like, but she was, you know, and she, she had TB when she was younger, and there was a lot of TB, and um, that's, for, that's probably nearly extinct now, but TB was a, a bad uh, lung infection. Uh. That was all down the, uh, the environment, the bad nutrition, the bad and, and bad nutrition and stuff like that. There, you know. And uh, after a few short years, in over two or three years, in the camp was empty when Kitty Lynch and uh, Francis Lynch and their families got house, one got house in Pitt Street and one got house in Craigan Street. And Kitty Lynch, when she closed the door on her hot and springtime camp, that was the end of the story of Springtime Camp.